Hi, welcome to the second episode of News Clicks Dispatches from Russia. And this in this episode, we are talking about Japan. Japan, Japan, Japan is the buzzword in Russia. And imagine that at a World Cup, we are talking about Japan, an Asian country. Uh, such has been the opening week of the World Cup. There, there have been many surprises. Uh, Japan beating a South American nation, Colombia, for the first time. Uh, that's a big thing. Along with that, Mexico beating Germany. Russia qualifying for the next round. So there's a lot of talking points, a lot of surprises. And we at NewsClick are trying to figure out whether these are cases of a team punching above their weight, a fluke, for instance, or is it that they have finally started playing to their own potential? We have in NewsClick studio today, Vaibhav Raghudandan, a football writer. And joining us from Russia is Siddhant Ane. So hi, Siddhant. Uh, where are you this day? Which match are you following this, this, uh, this evening there? I, I guess it would be afternoon there. Yeah, actually, I've, uh, I'll have i let me never have to see when. I've actually uh, just arrived earlier today in Ekaterinburg, which is the farthest east that this tournament goes. Uh, it's on the border of Europe and Asia. I'm almost in the same time zone as you guys, just half an hour off. How did you get there? By train. Nice, long train journey. Yes, fairly long, overnight, but good, comfortable train. Pretty similar to what we have on... Pretty similar to the Dibrugar Rajdhani. <laughs> Talking about trains, I guess you must have had some chance to talk to some of the fans travelling for this match. Or, uh, how did the journey go? Yeah, it was... Uh, so, so, how they've done it is that there are designated trains to and from each match from various cities. So, for this game, uh, the train was from Kazan and it, it came in uh, carrying France and Peru fans for the most part. So, the restaurant car was pretty much like a open uh, bar all night. And uh, yeah, so the, the, the gentleman I was sharing the room today with was from Peru and, and he traveled all the way down from there to, and is following his team around. and. Of course, we said that it was a do or die match, but fairly optimistic, I think, of their team chances. I guess you have to be uh, if you're going to compete. And the fans are large numbers of Peru fans, actually, much more than, than the French people. Yeah, a couple uh, behind the you. Right? Of the city right now, yeah, they're, they're, they're guys all over. What uh, extremes do you? What extremes did your uh, did the did your co-passenger go to? Because we've heard of a Peru fan who put on. Uh, a massive amount of weight to get tickets in the uh, extra or whatever in the section that allows you extra privileges. Yeah, you put on 25 kilos. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, went, it wasn't that guy. And I'm not sure how much of a uh, sort of hardship putting on 25 kilos is. <laughs> Maybe he just drank beer for like three months. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, no, I, I mean, there's a bit of a language barrier because they speak Spanish mostly. So, uh, I didn't get it, it, too many details on his journey here, but it looked like he flew into Moscow and then uh, from there he be traveling around to follow his team. Getting 25 kilos, it's like weight of expectations in a way. Yeah, so <laughs> I just use that as an entry point basically to get into Japan, who has come into this World Cup without any weight of expectations as such. But what, what an amazing display. Yeah, uh, and uh, it's it's the talk of the town now, I guess. So but actually here, like, Leslie and me have slightly differing opinions. Leslie thinks it was an amazing display. And I think it was a bit fluky, simply because Colombia were essentially down to 10 men within three minutes of the game. And for a significant period of the game, they controlled the... Yeah, I mean, so, uh, no, the, the, both aspects, I don't think the red card was a fluke, it was a clear sending off. No, no, definitely. Uh, yeah. And after that happens, particularly so early in the game, when a team is, at least on paper, considered an outright favourite, expected to dominate proceedings, uh, it's still incumbent on Japan in this case to, like, 
take advantage of that positioning and and uh, all of that. And the coach, uh, uh, in fact, said as much. He wasn't too happy with the way they ended the first Very half. Um, but in the second half, the positioning got better, and they were able to utilize the man advantage because they were in the right place at the right time. So it was for me. I mean, that was like I don't know if you guys remember, and this is a really maybe uh, off the chart comparison, but. When Bangalore FC went down uh, to ten men in the the Super Cup, yeah, in the final, they yes. were still able to sort of establish dominance over the opposition despite being a man down, just because they were so much better. Now, in the case of Colombia and Japan, either Colombia were not able to exploit or or get together as a team, but definitely Japan were aggressive. They were on the ball. They were. Um, I mean, they were making good decisions, and they had, I think, in their team, a ton of experience, which at this level makes, I think, a big difference. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons why we are seeing all these results go the way they are is because there are a lot of young squads. A lot of big countries have needed young players in this competition. Uh, Japan have a few guys who have 100 caps already, who have seen everything they to see in football. So. So they're maybe they're peaking at the right time. Exactly. So it takes two hands to clap. Actually, so uh, Colombia going down uh, by by a, by a man, but Japan still had to establish their play. Japan still had to score. Japan still had to see through the 90 minutes, and they did beautifully. And so the question now is Japan's result or the result of, for instance, uh, Mexico against Germany, the defending champions, and. Uh, Russia, the host, I mean, I'm sure that's a celebration over there now. They uh, ensuring their knockout berth. All these things, are they pointing at, I mean, like Viber said, is it is it a punching above the weight? I would, I would put it as that rather than a fluke. Are they punching above the weight or is it that they have finally started playing to their potential? Or, because these countries... I mean, at the end of the day, they have already made it to the World Cup and it takes something to make, be there. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Russia, for Russia, it didn't take, yeah. you know, it took like a few billion dollars to get here. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but for the others, yeah, of course, they've gone through the qualification process and, and you can talk about how that is different for different continents and all that, but it's a longer con uh, conversation and maybe for a separate occasion. But, it's a combination of a lot of things, I think. There are so many major competitions for the big name players to win and to be involved in. That maybe, and I'm not saying this, I, I, know, I don't know this as a fact, it's all just like uh, a little bit of uh, conversation or discussion. Maybe the motivation at the World Cup for the bigger nations is not as much as for some of these guys out to prove a point. Yeah, of course, for Messi, it's a different story. For Ronaldo, it's a different story because they are trying to establish a level of greatness that we will never see uh, probably in our lifetime. Uh, so that's a completely different equation. But in general, smaller teams, I think, are able now to organize, to defend with a lot of commitment, a lot of bravery, a, lo a lot of art, and then execute set pieces the way they do in the training ground. You know? Japan got a goal off the corner, a headed goal. Uh, now, you wouldn't normally consider Japan a threat from an aerial position, uh, an aerial sort of, uh, an aerial threat. Not against Colombians who are maybe more physical and bigger opponents anyway. But yet, so, so actually that game was a clean sweep. That game was a clean sweep. It was a penalty a set piece and a corner and a free kick yeah, yeah? and uh, in fact we were just doing some uh, little statistics finding and we found that uh, over 50 percent of the goals scored till now this is uh, before the spain game last night for us uh, were scored via set pieces yeah. now there's a lot of uh, theories about this i'm sure we all have our own theories but I'm just going to go out and say, does VAR have something to do with this? I mean, there have already been more penalties awarded at this stage of the World Cup since 
the 1930s. And that kind of kills the... I mean, again, it's a, it I goes mean, both it's, ways. It's subjective, but yeah. It goes both ways. It cleans up your... I can see you're enjoying a bit of rain there. Yeah, it's starting to rain. I might have to move a little bit quickly in case it gets heavier. But for now, it's just a drizzle, so it should be fine. Uh, do set pieces or set piece goals have to do with VAR? I don't know. I just think that they have to do with like a lot of time spent on training to exploit these very specific scenarios. Uh, and muscle memory, blah, blah, blah. I mean, uh, India under 17, the only goal we scored at the World Cup was also off a set piece. So I'm not saying that it's completely sort of transformed into a physical sport, but at the highest level where there's a lot of stake and there's plenty to lose, I think teams tend to be very organized and play by the book. Why I'm why I'm talking about VAR here is because Usually in set pieces, especially balls that are going to be driven into the box, there's a lot of wrestling and you know, yeah. it's, it's something that you see in football, in the Premier League especially, really often. Have defenders become a little cautious about this physicality, about the wrestling, simply because they know that Big Brother's watching and... That, uh, no, I don't think so. No? That is fueling actually the criticism that football has already, uh, always had that, uh, I mean, if, if you put it in blunt terms, a lot of sissies, they fall, they cry. So, as this gay, as this thing taken out the physicality. In terms of the physicality of the game and, and how VAR is influencing that, I don't think that the physicality has been removed by VAR specifically the, the drama that some of these guys do is a consequence of television and, and uh, I mean personally I think none of us like it but uh, well, the interesting thing about that whole argument is that hopefully VAR can also be used to punish some of these guys who overdo the drama and not just in cases of penalties and uh, goals I mean, if a guy is diving, I see no reason why he shouldn't be getting a yellow card to the AR by the same logic that he can give away a penalty for his opposition. So, yeah, I think that, that hopefully we'll see the system evolving. I mean, to try something out at a World Cup is a bit uh, off the charts, I guess. But I guess that gives the right attention actually, it deserves because uh, we, I mean they do well or fail, that's the best platform because proof would be out there. Yeah. Do well or fail uh, reminds me, uh, that was pretty much a do well or fail moment for Russia and they seem to have done well, no? At the World Cup. Definitely. I mean as far as whatever coverage or whatever reportage I had read before the World Cup all spoke about how the Russian media and the Russian public had very little hopes from their team to a point where the team itself was extremely disillusioned by talking to the, about talking to the media and about talking to people and coming out in public. And, and well, as of now, I'm going to ask you the simplest question, can they win the World Cup? Uh, that would be interesting. I'm serious. Like, <laughs> those guys seem to run like 7,000 kilometers a game. Like, maybe I've been here now a few days, so maybe some of the uh, sort of prevalent pessimism about the national team is uh, has rubbed off on me. So uh, I don't think that that, that, that is a possibility. Uh, but I think more people will come out like, so. Uh, I was not in the city where the Russia game was happening. We tried to go to the fan zone in Kalran to watch it and, and it was, I mean, there were a hundred times, well, twice the number of people outside want, waiting to get in. So, the country has warmed up to uh, the tournament and is showing a bit of love to, to their team now, for sure. And they're playing well, I think they're playing, uh, I mean, a uh, couple of the goals they scored, it's been simple football, but passing the ball accurately, passing it quickly and 
taking advantage of holes in the opposition defense. They have not played against the best team, so that, that's... Uh, well, they'll get a chance in the next round. It's going to be... <laughs> and it's interesting that you mentioned simple football. So, uh, what is your take on the first week of action? As teams did well because they have done the basics, right? I mean, uh, what I mean is that uh, the, the teams, teams who have won, have they won because they play simple football, back to basic, simple stuff. The thing about international football, is that you, do, you have very little time as a collective unit to work out a specific playing style. You know, I mean, Argentina will not be Barcelona. And, uh, you know, Russia is not going to be Zenit St. Petersburg. So, as a collective, I guess, does it, is it like a, is it the teams that have come together as a collective and just formed a simple chemistry between themselves that seem to be doing well? Is there... Is there, Something to be to learned there. Yeah, is there any is there any logic to what is happening in Russia now? Uh, I mean, what you're saying, a lot of these, like, uh, Antoine Wiesman, Didier Deshaun, they both came out after the uh, first France game and said exactly this, that this is a repair, a new formation. It's a different setup with Devin Bele and Mbappe and Wiesman uh, playing in front. They're not used to that kind of uh, they have played together, so it will take time to get used to. I don't entirely buy the argument. I don't. I don't think it should take such fantastic players more than a couple of days of kicking about together to to get a sense of how they work because they all play at an extremely extremely high standard at the clubs that they play at, and also they are very gifted. I mean, this is a sport that they've been playing all their life, so it's not like they have to learn something completely new. But again, the I mean, this is while you're saying this, it also immediately what I can think of is Spain 2010 and Germany 2014. A majority of the players in those two sides were from at the most two clubs. Yeah, but that that sort of situation doesn't often happen in in world football, right? Everyone is all over the place. So if you have, uh, you're lucky enough. That the entire, for example, transport was based in Paris Saint Germain, but then that would kill the competitiveness of the domestic football completely. So I you have to be, it is what it is. Siddhant has to leave us in a hurry because he has to catch the shuttle to reach the stadium for the France versus Peru match. We are winding up this episode of Dispatch from Russia, and say, uh, until next time, we will have a clearer picture of which are the other teams who have qualified and also the trend as to what is happening at the World Cup. Uh, is it defying logic or is it, will it get back to the usual norms that world football is all about? Till then, happy viewing guys, enjoy the World Cup and have a great match, Siddhant. Uh, thank you. Yeah. See you guys. Yeah. 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 Yeah.